Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, that we have Siddharth uh, ready here today with us. He is a fourth year PhD student at uh, Berkeley AI lab. Uh, he's co supervised by Sergey Levine and Anka Dragon. Uh, and uh, he's working on a topic that uh, recently became quite, a, quite an interest in, uh, in our lab, that's uh, human in the loop machine learning. Well, he is focusing more on the reinforcement learning side, but nevertheless, very exciting work. Uh, he's a 40 year PhD student, but he has published already some really, really nice work at ICML, iClear, NeurIPS, and so on. Um, well, uh, I'll let Seher uh, tell us all about it. And uh, uh, as usual, will be, uh, we'll have a seminar until four and then everybody who has uh, more detailed questions, uh, want to have some follow-up discussion. Uh, Siddharth was kind enough to uh, be, make himself available for after the seminar. So he'll stick around for some questions. So yeah, if you have some uh, more detailed questions, uh, want to uh, discuss a few things, a few other things, uh, stick around after the uh, seminar on the uh, same Zoom call. Okay, uh, Siddharth, um, well, the floor is yours. Sounds good, thanks for the intro. All right, so this talk is gonna have two halves. Um, so I think technically they're both time for 15 minutes each, each, so we should be able to get through both. But uh, feel free to interject with questions since we do have so much buffer time. I think that'll make things flow a bit uh, better. And uh, I, I wanna make things clear rather than thorough. That, that's my priority. So uh, yeah, uh, for the first half of this talk, I'd like to present some, some of our recent work on assisted perception. And the goal of this project is to help users uh, estimate the state of the world in sequential decision-making tasks like robotic teleoperation and navigation with visual impairments. So consider a visually impaired user trying to navigate a house. They can't directly perceive the scene in front of them. Uh, so looking at the, uh, the house from a bird's eye view, they might be trying to reach a position in the middle. And while they think they're in one corner of the house, in reality, they might actually be in a different corner. And this mistaken state yes. estimation can cause the user to move farther away from their goal instead of closer to it. So what exactly went wrong with the user state estimation procedure? Typically, the user would see, receive the full observation, then think to themselves, given the observation I just received and the action I just took, I'm probably now at the following state. And the state estimation process takes a full history of observations and actions and maps that history to a belief distribution over possible current states. So this user, after updating their beliefs, they take an action that makes sense to them given where they think they are at the moment. For example, walking toward the goal. The problem is that the user may have perception difficulties or other systematic biases that prevent them from making use of that full image observation in this case, which in turn prevents them from accurately estimating the state and then deciding what the optimal action should be. Users can have trouble processing observations like that for a variety of reasons, like not being able to pay attention to many different sensors at the same time, or experiencing lens distortions uh, that cause them to overestimate distances to obstacles, let's say. It could even be a more exotic effect, like an optical illusion affecting the user's biological vision system. Uh, so I, I love this roller illusion uh, because it seems to be animated and it could be because it's on a slide, but it's actually just a static image. So the key insight in this work is that the true full observations are actually not necessarily the most informative about the state, especially when they're being processed incorrectly by the user due to systematic biases in the user's perception. So we operationalize this insight by using an automated assistant to process the full observation on behalf of the user. Uh, this assistant performs state estimation unencumbered by the systematic biases or perception difficulties that the user may have. Although, of course, the agent might have, might have its own complementary uh, perception difficulties, uh, but we're ignoring those for now. Uh, then the assistant provides the user with a modified observation that is more accessible to the user than that full observation. 
And then the user can then take this modified observation, perform state estimation using their potentially suboptimal or biased estimator, uh, and then take their own actions. And we call this method assistive state estimation, or ACE. So the ultimate goal of this method, ACE, is to make the user's beliefs match their actual true state. Um, and one challenge with this approach is that the assistant doesn't necessarily know the true state. So we settle for trying to make the user's beliefs match the assistant's beliefs, which we assume maybe are not perfect, but are more accurate than the user's. So formally, uh, we try to minimize the KL divergence between the assistant's beliefs and the user's beliefs. After the assistant processes these uh, true observations, full observations, uh, it synthesizes a modified observation that it thinks will make the user believe in the same state as the assistant does. And the main challenge with this approach is that we don't have access, of course, to the user's internal state estimation process. This is uh, perhaps the main challenge. Uh, and we address this problem by learning a model of the user's belief update from demonstrations of user actions. So we're learning a model of, you could call it the user's internal model, so that we can uh, actually predict when the user is going to make a mistake and then kind of correct for that beforehand. So we start with an initial model of the user's internal state estimation process that makes some assumptions about what the user's systematic biases are and what their perception difficulties are. And then we use this initial model to assist the user and record the actions taken by the user while they were being assisted. Um, because this initial model is just an initial model, it may not be accurate yet. Uh, even with assistance, the user may still take suboptimal actions. So after the episodes are done, we ask the user which tasks they were trying to perform in these episodes so that we can compare uh, their actions to what the optimal actions would have been for those specified tasks. So we might ask them simply which goal states they were trying to reach in a navigation setting. So again, this enables us to compute the optimal policy for those training tasks. And then, because we know the optimal policy and we, we see what the user did differently, we can fit a new user model uh, that's different from the initial model that explains the gap between the optimal policy and the user's suboptimal actions. So this is a, a pretty important high-level idea. So we assume that the user's internal models are flawed. And the way we like, leverage this assumption is we, we take their suboptimal behavior or irrational behavior in the real world. And then we fit a model such that under this internal model, their, their behavior actually does seem quite rational. And then we actually do something with that learned internal model. So specifically, we train this internal user model to explain the actions that the user took that were different from the optimal actions. So we model the likelihood of the user taking a particular action given a history of observations and actions by marginalizing out the state. So this involves computing a near optimal policy for the completed task. And that's, that's again, one big caveat of the method. You have to be able to do this for the training tasks at least. And then we represent the user's beliefs using a parametric model like a neural network although this is kind of abstracted out from the method. And we trained our model of the user's state estimation process using a simple maximum likelihood objective over the demonstrations. And we found that empirically, this fairly straightforward approach worked well in our experiments. We were able to recover in synthetic experiments like the ground truth internal uh, user model parameters. And even with real users, we were able to recover. Who knows if it's the ground truth or not because you can't compare it to ground truth but it was good enough to actually provide good assistance later on. So in our experiments, we consider two types of tasks. Uh, tasks in which we uh, do assume prior knowledge about how the user's state estimation process is flawed, and other tasks in which we don't know a priori what the user's biases are. So we actually have to learn a model. Uh, we can't just provide assistance with some fixed initial model. So we look at MNIST. Uh, and a car racing game domain in which the user's perception is intentionally bandwidth constrained. So, so we add these constraints ourselves. Um, or the user's perception is subject to these intermittent delays in the arrival of new observations. So uh, you might be playing like a laggy version of the car racing game. Uh, we also look at a lunar lander game in which we might expect the user to consistently underestimate certain state variables, uh, but are not sure about exactly when or to what degree this will actually occur in a real person.
So in our first set of experiments, we assume the user is primarily affected by a limited sensor bandwidth. Uh, consider the navigation with visual impairment setting uh, that we described at the very beginning. Uh, the assistant might detect many different objects in the scene. But if the assistant simply tells the user about all of them at once, the user will probably be overwhelmed and may not be able to incorporate all of that new information and move toward their target. Uh, so you might think like one simple initial solution to this problem is just inform the user about only one of them at a time, only one of the objects. Uh, let's say selected uniformly at random uh, from the set of visible objects. And at each time step, keep doing this. The problem with this method is that it may end up providing the user with unfortunately uninformative observations about common objects that lie like everywhere around the house. And hence, they don't really help the user figure out where exactly they're standing right now. So while the user does get some information through these uniform random observations of, vis uh, of visible objects, they may still take a while to actually form these accurate beliefs and then make good decisions. So what our method does differently from this fairly simple baseline is it optimizes the assistant's choice of which one object to inform the user about at each time step. So uh, for example, by telling the user about landmark objects that can only be seen from the user's current position and from no other positions or angles, uh, the assistant can induce much more accurate beliefs in the user uh, using fewer uh, synthetic observations, which leads to better user actions. So we ran experiments first with simulated users navigating a simulated indoor environment. Uh, the guide can see the user's egocentric scene, but the user cannot under these assumptions that they are visually impaired. And the guide can also determine which objects are present in the scene. Uh, let's, in this case, we're actually using the ground truth semantic uh, mesh of these simulated environments, but you can imagine like an object detector or a segmentation network doing the same thing in the real world. And in the baseline condition, the uh, guide will simply select one of these objects it detects in front of it uniformly at random and tell the user uh, there is a wall visible or there is, there is a chair visible. So the user receives a categorical observation of an object from the guide and looks up uh, internally in the simulated user. Uh, they look up all known locations of the object throughout the house in their mental map. And then they update their beliefs about their current position orientation. Uh, and attempt to move along a shortest path to the goal, conditioned on their current beliefs. So what our method does uh, differently from the default guide is, again, it optimizes the choice of which object to tell the user is visible. So instead of just telling you that something like very common and very, very dull is visible, like the wall, the ceiling, a chair, which might be like ubiquitous throughout the house, it'll tell you that there's this one painting visible and maybe there aren't that many paintings throughout the house. So this like one observation uh, which was like judicious, judiciously chosen from the set of visible objects gives you much more information. We also ran an experiment with the 12 real human participants uh, classifying images of MNIST digits. And uh, we set it up so that by default, we revealed one row of pixels at each time step. So it was this uh, sequential classification uh, task. And we asked the user to attempt to label the image at each time step using only the pixels revealed so far. And in the default conditions, we just reveal the pixels from top to bottom. And as, as you might imagine, the user tends to take a while to correctly identify the digit since uh, informative pixels tend to be evenly distributed throughout the image, not just at the top. And in another baseline, we just revealed pixels in a uniform random order. So we just uniformly randomly picked a row that hasn't been revealed before and we revealed that. Um, and that's actually a pretty decent strategy since it kind of evenly distributes the, uh, the observations but it doesn't necessarily reveal informative pixels early in the episode. So it doesn't necessarily perform well early. And what our method tends to do is it quickly reveals rows with lots of pixels or pixels that are like very helpful for distinguishing between certain digits. And this enables the user to more accurately guess the label earlier, um, earlier more consistently than that uniform random baseline, which might randomly decide to just show you rows without any pixels at all that are pretty dull. So here's a step-by-step -step comparison of the two baselines in this uh, domain uh, with, our with our method. So when only 25% of the image has been revealed by time step seven, which is now, uh, 
the pixels revealed by our method make it easier to guess that the digit is indeed going to be a three by the time you get to the end compared to the others. So without assistance, it's, it's just awful. Uh, with random assistance, it's a little better. Like, uh, but you can see uh, it is kind of randomly shown you some rows at the top, which are not so interesting, but also randomly shown you a couple of rows in the middle, which are interesting. But ACE is like trying to paint you this kind of uh, staggered picture of the three because it has learned that if it shows you these pixels first, uh, it is likely to induce this uh, like latent belief state uh, in a user uh, that will enable them to classify the digit. So in the user study, we found that our method substantially outperformed the top to bottom condition and enabled the user to guess the label a bit earlier using fewer pixels than the random baseline. Although the, the gap isn't too substantial as you get into the later part of the episode when you've already gotten to reveal more and more rows of pixels. So now that we've looked at two domains where we know the user is bandwidth constrained, uh, let's look at a different domain where the problem is uh, not bandwidth, but qualitatively different. It's intermittent observation delays. Um, so in this real-time driving video game, at each time step, the user receives an image observation. It's like a top-down image of this uh, simulated environment. They process that observation, and they choose to steer the car left or right to stay on the road and avoid the grass. They then get a new observation at the next time step and repeat. Uh, but sometimes, unexpectedly, the environment will not provide a new observation at the next time step. And instead of showing the user uh, a blank screen, uh, the default interface simply copies the previous image and shows it to the user again. And the problem, of course, with this method is that the user may not be able to incorporate the delay into their state estimation process. And as a result, they might take too long to react to these time-sensitive situations, like approaching a left turn. And in practice, even when the users could clearly tell that there was a delay, like usually you can tell when an interface is laggy, they still weren't actually able to like operationalize that and adjust their actions to deal with that delay. So even when the user, even when this fundamental assumption that let's say the user's internal model is wrong, like even if the internal model is right, it might still be helpful to fit an internal model to explain their suboptimal actions. So uh, th that's another theme that maybe we can discuss after the talk, which I, I find quite interesting which is that these methods can be useful even when all the assumptions about what is going on inside the user's head isn't quite true. So instead of copying the last observation, as in the default interface, our method is going to construct a synthetic image observation that is representative of the assistance belief state. And showing the user this prediction of what the assistant thinks the current observation could be uh, given that it's like integrated all the information from the previous time steps and actually like forward simulated uh, what the current time step is going to be like using its own dynamics model. Um, this enables the user to better estimate their position, orientation, and speed. And of course, in turn, enables them to make these uh, time sensitive decisions. So here are some uh, videos from the user study. On the left, you can see uh, the video feed periodically getting stuck due to these intermittent uh, delays. And in the middle, whenever the true video feed drops out, the assistant actually fills in the missing frames automatically with its own predicted images. So the assistant doesn't have like privileged access to the like undelayed environment since we're trying to like model real world applications. What the assistant is doing is it's, uh, it's, it's maintaining this uh, belief distribution over uh, what the current state could be in some latent state space. And then it's actually just uh, synthesizing an observation that is representative of this estimated current state, and then showing this predicted image to the user instead of the default potentially delayed image. And the predictions do tend to match the ground truth more closely than those default delayed images. So the users tended to drive on the road and stay off the grass much more often when they played with the assistant's predicted video feed than when they played with the default delayed video feed, which I thought was somewhat surprising because while these predictions are supposed to be like more representative of what's actually going on, right? They're, they're hopefully undelayed. They are also synthetic. So users, I, I forced my users to play in a, this like fantasy video game environment where they didn't get these crisp images. They're actually getting these synthetic images synthesized from like a VAE decoder model. Uh, so it, it was actually quite nice uh, to show that even uh, with these like learned image decoders, a person can actually figure out well, like, what the heck is going on in this image and actually take appropriate actions. 
In our third set of experiments, we had human participants play a, a variant of the Lunar Lander game in which we deliberately made the Lunar Lander uh, difficult to see. And we also added a horizontal bar on the lander to help the user perceive the angle of the lander or the tilt of the, la of the lander. And we set up the game to let the user just focus on keeping the lander level as it descends uh, using the left and right keyboard keys to control these lateral thrusters that will effectively rotate the lander clockwise or counterclockwise. And what made this game different from navigation and driving is that uh, we weren't sure how exactly the user state estimation process would be biased. Like we were hope we were intending to like create this bias where because you can't perceive the angle so clearly, you'll have to rely on that horizontal bar, that little widget uh, that we added. Uh, but we weren't sure uh, like like would users be able to perceive like even like minute tilts? Uh, would they have trouble if the tilt was like uh, really extreme? Uh, we we weren't sure, but we, we were expecting that there would be a problem in the user's uh, perception of the tilt. So in the default interface without any assistance, we simply rotated the tilt indicator, that horizontal red bar, to match the lander's true angle. And the problem with this default interface is that it's, while it's easy to tell when the lander is severely tilted, it's harder to tell when the lander is only slightly tilted. And this is a problem for the user, since keeping the lander level requires detecting tilt very early when it's still small so that the thrusters have enough time to force the lander upright because of inertia. Um, by collecting data of the user's actions with that default unassisted interface, our method can learn a model of the user uh, that uh, portrays this user as underestimating the lander's angle. That seems to be a user model that explains their observed actions quite well. And this ends up leading to an assistant policy that rotates the tilt indicator past the lander's true angle uh, to actually exaggerate the tilt. So even if you're tilted a little bit, uh, as, as you'll see in a moment, it, it, it might just swing wildly if it sees you acting very suboptimally in the, in the initial demonstrations. So this exaggeration is uh, easier for the user to detect. And as a result, the user tends to respond earlier even to minute tilts because they see the, the indicator swinging wildly. So here you can see the assistant exaggerating that tilt indicator. And that's especially helpful early in the episode because again, like while it's, it's not being honest, it is making it easier for the user to figure out when they need to start counter rotating with their thrusters. So users who are shown the exaggerated tilt indicator were able to keep the lander more, uh, more level uh, than the users who were just shown the default interface with the no uh, deviation from the true angle. And interestingly enough, our method learned a different angle distortion factor for each user. Uh, and it seems to depend on the user's competency without assistance. So for users who performed reasonably well with the default interface, um, it tended to learn only slightly exaggerated uh, angles. But for other users who performed very poorly with the default interface, like it took them a very long time to perceive when the, the lander was actually tilted, it learned to swing the indicator wildly to indicate even just tiny changes. So I thought that was cool. We didn't explicitly tell it to do that, but it makes sense that that's the sort of policy it would learn. Uh, so it is capable of personalizing to different users. So actually that's the end of the first half of this talk. And I'm happy to take any questions before uh, time permitting, we move on to the second half. So I actually have a question. Uh, I mean, you kind of mentioned it. Um, so it's honesty uh, of AI system, right? So you, uh, potentially run into some kind of trust, trust issues. Uh, if users know that uh, potentially the system is uh, kind of fooling them to make them believe, uh, I mean, of course, if, they're, if they think that the goals are aligned, that's all nice, but uh, as a general principle, it might be a bit tricky. Uh, so just wondering about what, what your thoughts were on that. That's a, that's a very good point. I guess uh, I kind of swept that under the rug of it. I, I'm assuming that the user is okay with uh, having this assistant supply them with observations that are not necessarily like the ground truth, uh, like full observations. Um, yeah, so like one solution uh, to like dealing with the trust problem is to just tell the person that, the, or like convince the person that this agent is aligned with their uh, intent. Like, like the agent is actually just trying to make their beliefs more accurate and help them make better decisions and that might be sufficient. Even if not, 
I suppose uh, there may be some like domain specific things that you could do uh, to mitigate this. So instead of just showing the user like one single optimized observation, you might produce like a ranking, let's say. So the agent now, instead of just providing you with this uh, giant list of visible objects in the navigation setting, let's say, um, it might, instead of just sing uh, singling out a single observation that it thinks is optimal to give you, it might rank the list. So if you really cared to, you could actually go through the entire ranking and look at all the visible objects. Um, or you could trust the uh, system and only look at like the top K uh, ranked items. And so there it's, uh, it's still providing you with some assistance, but in the end, like depending on your own level of trust in the system, you, you can actually kind of like do the task uh, more autonomously. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um... So another question is, um, so when, you, when you're training the model uh, and uh, when the model is fitted, uh, so how well, uh, in absolute sense, how well you can predict user, user actions? I'm just curious, uh, like, I, I mean, I have done a lot of cognitive modeling, which kind of does the same uh, or similar thing, uh, but it didn't try really uh, with uh, deep neural networks as you were using here. And uh, I'm just wondering, like, how, how accurate you can, uh, get with the uh, deep neural networks? That's a good question. I haven't actually like reported any of these numbers because I guess ultimately it wasn't like the most relevant thing to our evaluation. It was more like a debugging step. Like, like sure. ultimately what we needed was for this learned internal model to be accurate enough to provide assistance later. And then we measured performance with and without assistance. So to some extent, uh, the way we train this internal model is of course to predict the user's actions. Um, but whether it's like actually like an objectively like accurate predictor of human actions is, uh, yeah, my, my cop out answer is that I don't know exactly. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, mm -hmm. but I think for this specific application, because that's not ultimately what we're going to do with this model, um, it is maybe uh, not critical that it be very accurate, like that it have like 99% accuracy in predicting the human's actions in that training set. Like even if it only has like 60% accuracy, I'm say like a balanced binary classification data set. Um, that, that would still be fine with me, as long as those learned internal model parameters were actually useful for making assistance uh, decisions downstream. Right, okay, thanks. Well, I have a question. Um, sure. How data efficient is your approach in terms of learning the biases of the user? And then is there, a, is there an effect of like, do you let the users practice first so that they're not learning whilst you're also trying to model them? Right. So in all the user studies, we gave them like a very short practice uh, phase of, let's say, like five to 10 episodes in each domain. And uh, I don't remember the number of demonstrations we needed off the top of my head. Um, but for the user studies, like surprisingly few. Um, and that might be because we weren't being too ambitious and we weren't trying to learn a very complicated and expressive user model in the, the real human uh, subject studies. Um, but in the, uh, in the simulated experiments, I think the paper does have a figure where with simulated MNIST classifier users, um, it does show how performance scales with the number of demonstrations you get at training time. But you didn't have to make any you didn't have to account for trying to be more data efficient so that you didn't, because presumably your users have a limited amount of attention and patience. So um, you don't want to exhaust that. Right, so, so ultimately the kind of knob we turned to make the user studies feasible to run in let's say like half an hour to an hour uh, was to learn uh, user models with fewer parameters as opposed to modifying the, the method itself. So we could get away with less, less data because the models just had fewer parameters. Okay, cool. Yeah. Nice. And Sergio has a question. Yes, thank you. It's actually related to Ian's question. So I, I miss a little bit how do you use the optimal policy for the training? So do you have like an error between, I mean, the deviation of the user from the optimal policy? So you learn models until the user behaves properly or how do you do that? So the place where we actually use that optimal policy is in representing the likelihood of the user's actions. So right here, what we're trying to do ultimately is like fit a model to maximize the likelihood of the user's actions. 
And what we actually care to do is like, if we want to fit the parameters of this uh, state estimation procedure, uh, the thing on the right here. And we don't actually want to learn, we could in principle learn this like policy as well, but we'd prefer to just assume that we have access to the optimal policy conditioned on states and then fit uh, the parameters of this uh, belief distribution update uh, to explain the actual observed user actions. So, so the idea here is we need to know the optimal policy because we're assuming that the user's actions are optimal with respect to their internal beliefs, which may be incorrect. But in order to know what uh, optimality means, we need access to that optimal policy for the training tasks. At test time, we actually don't need to know what the task is at all, let alone an optimal policy. Right. Okay, I see if you think this for my music. And the other question is what you mentioned that you cannot only compensate some biases in the perception, but actually there is no difference. It could be just a bias on the model of the wall of the user, right? That's very cool. Right, so I guess it's a, maybe like a philosophical difference, right? Whether perception is part of like the, the whole like planning process or whether there are like internal models involved. Uh, or if it's like a purely behavioral process. Um, but yeah, empirically, I guess, making this assumption tends to lead to good assistance. I, I, I think that's like the main empirical claim I want to make in this talk or in these papers in general. Like I, I can't claim to like have learned like the actual internal model of these users or like to have shown that this is actually what they're doing under the hood, like, like this behavioral model right here on this slide. Like it, it's probably not true. It might be close to the truth, but probably not. But uh, it turns out it's, it's still like a very pragmatic thing to do because if you follow this procedure, you, learn, you fit this belief model of how the user might be doing things under the hood. It, it ultimately leads to good assistance. It was very good. It reminds me, I mean, everyday life that you, about language when you try to communicate with people who have some bias in some, in some service or some, some personality, they react differently to different things. And, you adapt yourself to that, right? This reminds me about that. Right, like, like one example in like education might be, you don't actually know if you, you've taught your student anything, but like you see that they did well on the test after your lecture. So, you know, maybe something could happen in the middle. Cool, thanks. Yep. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so how much time do we actually have? We have 25 more minutes. Excellent. Okay. So if there are no other questions about this first half, I think I can get through the second half in time. Okay. Cool. So for the second half of this talk, I'd like to talk about a, a different but related project on helping users with control instead of perception. So now instead of biases in like the state estimation procedure in these partially observable environments, we're gonna look at biases in planning or like actually the decision-making process. So here's a video of me playing uh, or at least attempting to play this Lunar Lander game that I discussed before, but without any of those like weird modifications about visibility or not being able to see the tilt. So despite having lots of practice on this game by now, uh, I still lose control of the vehicle and crash. And I know that the goal is to land between the flags. So I, I know the task and I've seen like successful demonstrations by an agent. Um, so the question is like, why do I still uh, fail? Like every, every single time. And it's not just me, um, all of the participants in our user study for this paper performed basically the same in the default setting. And one explanation I'd like to put forward uh, for this behavior, it might be, uh, you know, multi, multifactorial, but one explanation of the suboptimality that you just saw is that the human's internal beliefs about the dynamics of this lunar lander vehicle in this video game environment are systematically different from the actual like game engine's physics. And this idea might explain why humans struggle to teleoperate robots over laggy networks or have trouble controlling prosthetic limbs through, uh, let's say, brain computer interfaces. Uh, and the key idea in this work is that a human's internal dynamics model can be different from the real dynamics of the world. And that while human actions may appear to be suboptimal or irrational in the real world, they might actually be optimal with respect to the human's internal dynamics model. 
So to test this hypothesis, our general approach uh, was to collect demonstrations, um, as in the previous project, and to fit a dynamics model that explains the demonstrated actions. So it's a bit funny. Instead of fitting a dynamics model to like actual observed state transitions in the real world, we're going to fit a dynamics model to explain user actions. So in these demonstrations that we collect, we assume that the reward function is known, uh, just to simplify things, although in principle, you could learn that simultaneously. Um, so we, we, learn, uh, we learn the internal dynamics model and assume the reward function is known. And we also assume the internal dynamics model can systematically deviate from the real dynamics. So for example, a classic result in the cognitive science literature shows that humans tend to underestimate the effects of inertia, uh, let's say in projectile motion. Uh, to illustrate this idea, think back to the last time you played a car racing game. So personally, I'm uh, terrible at them. Uh, because I keep making sharp turns while going too fast. Like I, I, I don't break before the turn. So I end up skidding and crashing into the barriers around the road. And there again, like I know what the task is, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I think my, my internal physics model is just, it just never learns. Uh, it never kind of approaches the real dynamics for some reason. And in this example, uh, your internal predictions of the outcomes of your actions are different from the actual outcomes generated by nature. So again, imagine you're moving a point mass toward the, the star in the middle using arrow keys on a keyboard. So a simple like 2D navigation task. And if you thought that your keys gave you control over velocity and that inertia didn't exist, and the control interface in the game physics actually agreed with that, then your trajectories would look, look nice and smooth and straight like this. Uh, but if instead, uh, you were stubborn and we dropped you into a different world, one in which the arrow keys actually controlled acceleration instead of velocity and inertia was a thing, then your trajectories might look wild and oscillate like this. If, if your policy was still kind of like uh, optimal under the assumptions that there was, there was no inertia and that you're controlling velocity directly. So in this work, we propose a learning algorithm that takes your suboptimal demos in the real world and then fits a model of your internal dynamics beliefs that explains the demonstrated actions better than the real dynamics. So that's the key. It's, it's going to explain your actions better than the real dynamics would have. So while your actions are not optimal with respect to the real dynamics, they are optimal by assumption with respect to this fitted internal model. So specifically, we adopt the maximum causal entropy uh, inverse RL framework. Uh, where we model human actions as being so-called Boltzmann rational uh, or noisy rational with respect to the demonstrator's Q function, uh, which we can define recursively in terms of the demonstrator's reward function and the internal dynamics model, not the real dynamics, but the internal dynamics using the soft Bellman equation. And to estimate the internal dynamics model, we formulate a constrained optimization problem in which we fit that Q function to maximize the likelihood of the demonstrations while enforcing the constraint that the Q function be optimal with respect to the known rewards and our parametric model of the internal dynamics. So what's going on is we're trying to maximize the likelihood of the observed user actions. And the way we do that is directly through the Q function because in the, the Boltzmann rational model, the action likelihoods are a function of these Q values. But in turn, the Q values have to be consistent with respect to what we are learning is the internal dynamics model. So in a sense, the key function is acting as this kind of like intermediary uh, between maximizing the action likelihoods and respecting the constraints of the Bellman equation. So by simultaneously maximizing the action likelihoods with respect to the Q value parameters and satisfying the Bellman constraints uh, using both the Q values and the internal dynamics model parameters, we're able to fit an internal dynamics model to maximize the likelihood of the actions, even though you can't like you can't really write out like an uh, like an analytical expression for the action likelihood as a function of the internal dynamics model parameters, because it's the result of this like fixed point computation. So we approximately solved that problem by sampling constraints as in standard deep Q learning, and recasting the problem as an unconstrained optimization using the penalty method. So here we're simply minimizing the, uh, the sum of squared Bellman errors as in most deep Q learning uh, methods. And this way you can use uh, existing machinery and existing code bases 
uh, to simply run gradient descent to search for an internal dynamics model that maximizes the demonstration likelihoods. So if you try using this algorithm, uh, unsurprisingly, you'll find that there tend to be many different internal dynamics models that equally well explain the demonstration data. So there's this identifiability problem. And we've come up with two different uh, approaches to deal with this issue uh, that essentially regularize the learned internal model. So one is fairly straightforward, but it comes at a cost. It's training on multiple tasks uh, with different known reward functions. So maybe like navigating to different goal positions uh, or trying to execute different maneuvers. And this forces the learned internal dynamics model to explain demonstrated actions that come from a variety of different policies intending to do different tasks. And the second uh, ingredient that we have to regularize is we impose this prior on the learned internal dynamics model that forces it to be similar in some sense to the real dynamics. Um, and uh, I can dis discuss the details offline, but the idea is that the internal dynamics should uh, like never allow you to like, maybe like imagine that you can like teleport somewhere. Like you can only ever deviate from the real dynamics um, in so far as like, let's say your actions are uh, mixed up. Like, like you thought that steering left would take you left, but actually it's gonna take you right. Or like when you were scrolling on your iPhone, you thought like flicking your thumb up was gonna like scroll you down, but actually it scrolls you up because you're on like an older version of iOS. So you never imagine that you're able to take like an infeasible state transition. All your imagined or like predicted state transitions are feasible, but wrong. So now that we have a model of the internal dynamics, uh, we can actually model user behavior and uh, thus better infer intent from observed suboptimal user actions. So one application of this, which is maybe not my favorite application, but I think it does bear mentioning, is like debiasing inverse RL from suboptimal or misguided demonstrations. So if you're just to apply inverse RL to the user's suboptimal demonstrations, you might infer that they, they love to be late to meetings and they love to crash into things uh, because I guess the standard inverse RL assumptions is that uh, the demonstrations are optimal or like noisy optimal, but not necessarily systematically biased in this way. So our approach does let you actually first uh, fit an internal dynamics model to explain the suboptimality or like the gap between the user's actions and what the optimal policy would have been. And then later on with tasks where you you just get the demonstrations, you don't actually have a, a reward function beforehand. You can do inverse RL with respect to the internal dynamics model that you've learned so that you actually recover the proper reward function um, and not a reward function that says you, you like to do bad things. And the other application which I, I like a lot more is uh, this thing called internal to real dynamics transfer uh, for, for assisting people with control. So in real time, what happens is Let's say the user gets this state observation. And the user observes the state, plans an action that they think will take them to their desired next state, and then input that action that they've planned into the system. And then our assistive agent sees the user's control input and the system state. And then it uses its knowledge of the real dynamics as well as the learned internal dynamics model of the user's beliefs, to then pick potentially a different action that will achieve the user's desired state transition under the real dynamics of the world. So, so it's a lot like sim to real dynamics transfer, except here the sim is like the user's like fantasy internal dynamics model. And uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the cool thing about this approach is that it's this like uh, greedy assistance policy, if you will, that uh, lets the user, it, it helps the user achieve their desired state transitions at every single time step. So in, in principle, it lets them kind of follow arbitrary trajectories and it works in an online fashion. So you don't actually have to wait around for like multiple demonstrations before your assistants can actually like figure out what's going on and then kick in and do the task for the user. At every single time step, it's trying to make the real dynamics of the world feel more like the user's internal dynamics. And it does this silently by just substituting the user's actions. So it's interpreting the user's actions maybe pragmatically, if you will, it, it, instead of literally. Instead of literally taking the action that the user tells you to take, you figure out what the, what the user like thinks is going to happen, but won't necessarily happen because they have the wrong beliefs. 
and then you'll take a different action to actually satisfy that desired state transition. So yeah, here, here are some videos with and without assistance. And uh, it, it feels pretty great uh, to play this video game with assistance compared to without assistance. Like it, it just feels more natural. Like if you told me that I wasn't being assisted, I would just tell you that this was a better video game, like better designed. Uh, so here are uh, trajectories that summarize uh, those two videos. So with assistance, the paths tend to actually like safely land at the target more often than without assistance. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, just to recap, first we discussed how to assist users with bias perception uh, by learning a model of how exactly their state estimation procedure is biased and then showing them observations that when processed by their biased perception system will actually then arrive at accurate state uh, estimates. And in the second part of the talk, we assume that maybe perception is fine, but actually your internal dynamics beliefs are wrong. In that case, we fit a model of what those wrong beliefs are. And then we silently modify your actions um, during real-time control to make the real world actually seem more like your internal dynamics beliefs. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so happy to take any questions now. Thanks a lot. Uh, I've yeah. got a question. Sure. Uh, so, so for the last example that you showed, I guess that the the controller only has the the only the only input that it has is the user's actions, right? Like it doesn't right. have any it doesn't have any view of like the state of the world because obviously yeah. Right. So it only gets the current state and the user's action. That's all it has to go on. I intentionally don't give it the entire history or, or anything like that because I, I wanted to do this very narrow kind of greedy assistance. Like I, I guess so. So if it if it. I mean, when you say state, I mean basically what 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 does it have available to it? Because because I, I I mean you know, uh, if I was being really cynical, you could just say well totally ignore the user's input and just solve the problem using with without it, right? Right. So you can't actually do that because you don't know what the task is. You don't have a reward function. Like uh, okay, you have okay, like yeah, actually yeah, nothing to go on at test time. Yeah. So okay. training time, we make all these like crazy assumptions, right? We we know the reward function. Mm user gives us like full demonstrations and, and yeah, uh, I, I kind of took liberties with training time assumptions because I knew a test time, you could just do whatever you want. Like you could actually like try to crash the car and like, so yeah, we'll, we'll help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really, really helpful. Thanks. One question. Yeah. Second. So I wonder, I'm thinking about the, the so another application of this method. For instance, suppose you have a nonlinear control system with nonlinear dynamics, right? So in principle, we can control easily linear dynamics. Could you use this to make a translation for a controller? So make a, make a controller that can work in a very simple dynamics and then use these to actually map in the, in the original problem or something like that? I see. So like we have this hammer now and maybe we can search for different nails. So like the nail I've been talking about is this application where the human's internal beliefs are flawed and you want to assist. But you're saying that like maybe it doesn't have to be the human's internal beliefs that are flawed. It could be like another agent, like another controller that was trained with some simplified dynamics, maybe because of like computational constraints. Exactly. And that like maybe... No, go on, go on. Exactly. So... I wonder if this will actually be the right method. Because uh, because now the question is like, I, I guess like you could just like challenge the premise. Like why aren't you just like training a controller or like designing a con controller with like the actual like nonlinear dynamics model? Like even with some approximations, maybe that will be like, okay. I, I think the reason why this method makes sense here and like put, could potentially make sense in other cases where it's not quite the same human in the loop learning problem is that you just fundamentally don't have access to the human's internal model. And so all you can really hope to do is assist in this way, in this kind of indirect, like internal to real dynamics transfer way. Um, the, the problem is you like, you don't know what the user wants to do. And uh, yeah, all you have to go on is like the current state and the user's action input. Whereas in the other case, like presumably you might have a lot more information about what the task is and then 
maybe exactly what the ground truth internal dynamics beliefs are because you train that controller yourself and so on. So I suspect there might be better ways to do it. Maybe. maybe. Okay, thanks. Okay, I have a question. Um, so I, I, uh, I remember you, you had some uh, results about, uh, you, you asked users uh, whether they were happier uh, in this case where you provided them with assistance. Uh, and they seemed like, yeah, they were kind of more satisfied and uh, happier, had a good, better experience. Um, but I wonder whether you, you told them how the system really worked, that uh, it really took control away from them in a sense. Uh, right. Um, so they know that the system was modifying their actions. I, d I don't remember if I actually told them that up front. Like after the, the user studies, I would tell them anything. But up front, I think I was pretty sparing with the explanations. I, d I just said we would assist you. But I never said how. So like, I think if I remember correctly, like the user could have thought that their actions are being modified, but they also could have thought incorrectly that like maybe I was changing the video game like settings themselves, like changing like the physics constants and stuff to make it easier, which of course I was not doing because in the real world, you, you can't change the physics constants to make things easier. Yeah, Th That's a good point. Uh, so I guess this, this question of trust comes back, like is the user actually okay with like the system taking potentially different actions. I think the cop out answer again is like, I think it's fine as long as the user has like had some practice with the system and is perhaps like, <laughs> it sounds sounds a bit uh, wonky, but like has built up an internal model of how the system operates. So like their, their internal dynamics like now incorporate the fact that they're being assisted, but like in a good way, in like a constructive way. So to them, it just feels like yet another interface that could have been the default interface. Yeah. Thanks. I have a, a question. Um, so in the, the stuff you've looked at, all the environments have um, deterministic dynamics. And perceivably, you could also be biased in a way that differs from stochastic dynamics. And I guess that makes the problem a lot harder, but I wondered if you considered that. So are you saying the real world uh, or the internal model has stochastic dynamics or both potentially? Potentially both, but the real world is definitely stochastic. Right. Hmm. I, I think, I mean, the same principles apply, I guess. I just I haven't really thought through how, uh, how you might apply like how it would work out in practice. And you know, I guess I'm putting you on the spot, but I, I wondered if you'd already thought about it. So I think in principle, you could just maybe like naively apply the same like equation like that's on the current slide um, or, or maybe some other like uh, divergence metric. It, it, it kind of doesn't matter in my opinion, like which, which metric you choose. You just pick the one that's like appropriate for the domain and for the, the real dynamics assumptions. Um, I think as long as there is an action that will actually like minimize that divergence, then I think this assistance will be helpful. Of course, like user studies might tell you otherwise. It, it might be the case that like actually users feel more assisted, not when like the exact distributions match, because like in the end you only ever realize like one sample from it at each time step. So the user might not realize that you're doing like you might be like really good at minimizing divergence, but the user is like who cares? They only see the sample. So, so maybe there's a different metric that actually matters when the dynamics are stochastic. I, I guess in a similar vein, on a slightly different topic, and just a comment here, I guess you could view that like in some ways, what you could do is calibrate the difficulty of a task with, by changing the level of assistance rather than changing the task itself, which might actually be more satisfying as a user. Like if I'm playing a game, I don't want the level to be easier. I want to actually be able to do it. And if I get assistance, maybe that's better than just, you know, having fewer enemies or fewer things to do. Um, right. Yeah, I, I like to think of this method as like, like another application that I did not explore was exactly this kind of curriculum learning, let's say for humans or, or potentially even like RL agents. Um, but yeah, it's, it's almost like training wheels, right? It's like not changing the fact that you're riding a bike. It's just making the dynamics of it easier at first. And then like eventually maybe you can get rid of them. Yeah, because I think in... The work on some previous work, you can change 
there's work where it maps your action to the best action that's like above some certain level of reward that you can expect to get and it's like changing that level is sort of similar to changing how much assistance you get and, and the, the, I, I see like you. the idea yeah. cool yeah any other questions or suggestions so uh i guess this this latest dynamics paper um it's not quite the latest thing anymore it's like from 2018 but we actually just uh, finished up the uh, assisted perception project a few months ago. So that's, that's fairly recent. So I'm also sort of on, on the hunt for any related problems or potential like applications where this, this kind of thing might be useful or the, this broad approach of like using what I, what's called like theory of mind, like modeling the humans like internal beliefs um, and preferences to, to actually provide better assistance. So I, I, I'd love to hear more about that. Have you thought of uh, settings where potentially uh, humans would be interested in uh, kind of gaming the system? So if your, uh, if your AI assistant is trying to tell you uh, to do this, but you wanted to actually uh, to take slightly different action and uh, then you modify your action to kind of persuade the system to go in a certain direction. Do you see what I mean? I see what you mean. But I wonder if that's fundamentally different from just like the user learning to use the system better um, and ultimately just it, it feeling like yet another interface. I guess like philosophically, I wonder if there's like a difference between the user gaming, like let's say like a fixed system uh, versus, I don't know, like is it really gaming? I, I wonder, or is it like, just adaptation in like a constructive sense. Yeah, could be. And then it's just a matter of who who knows what is the what is the truth? Is it the human or, or the system, right? Because humans can be can be wrong as well. Uh, they don't necessarily have correct beliefs, as you are here uh, showing, right? Uh, so, but while that's true, I guess might want to steer the system in, in their direction. So ultimately, if the system is doing its job, that's exactly <laughs> what I wanted to do. So I assume that the user's preferences, like their, their internal reward function at test time, is private information, and that they, for whatever reason, just can't like write it down or explain it very clearly to the agent. And so if the system like works like perfectly well, in my opinion, then the user will do exactly like the task that they, that they intend to do, um, even though their beliefs about like dynamics or how observations work might be off. So in a sense, actually like gaming is like a feature as opposed to like a bug. Mm -hmm. Actually want the user to like do exactly what they want to do. Right, 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 yeah, okay. Uh, anybody else? Uh, any other question? Um, Vincent, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Um, just a, a comment because I, li I like your your work. Um, I've uh, worked in the past in uh, also in cognitive science, like Avoyer, and there is a an emerging field maybe called uh, computational psychiatry, and some aspect of computational cognitive science maybe as well. Was taking this approach a lot, maybe to say, um, can we infer? Uh, the utility function of some agent, can you infer its model of the environment? And can the learned, can the actual inferred models uh, help us categorize uh, uh, subjects like into psychiatric disease or things like this? Um, and um, uh, so I don't know if you've heard about this, but there is a, I think, I think there is a big community or large enough community using these tools in the cognitive science world. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, I, I'd, I'd uh, suggest you have a look into that if you haven't already, which I guess you have. But, uh. Oh, I, I'll look into it. I actually haven't heard of computational psychiatry before. Um, so like one related thing I did want to mention that I have heard of, but I haven't like properly explored is this, um, uh, so like uh, in the uh, infant psychology or like developmental uh, psychology, uh, they do these studies with like babies and like 
you can't just ask the baby like what <laughs> what it thinks of the world. You have to like come up with some indirect way of testing, um, like like what it is that they think is going to happen next. Um, so like like for example, you, you might uh, like track the baby's gaze. Like do do you actually like look at a face? And that's like one indication that maybe they're like uh, doing some kind of like face recognition type stuff. Um, but I, I was wondering, like maybe in developmental psychology or other areas of cognitive science, where it's it's hard to explicitly elicit someone's uh, beliefs about how the world works. Like maybe it's just it's just too difficult to verbalize. Maybe instead you could just ask them to do some tasks and then like figure out what their actions imply about their beliefs and then use yeah, that. Yeah, actually, um, in this domain, um, I'm sure there is a lot to do. Maybe there are like um, stages of development which are which results in super sharp difference in behavior. For example, uh, some kids at some point don't understand what a uh, quantity of liquid means, and suddenly they get a notion of volume. And, and so what they do with glass of water or things like that changes almost uh, all at once. And all kids seems to follow the same sort of path, maybe not at exactly at the same time, but the same order. So I guess people have used classic uh, psychology experiments to, to reveal this, but there is a lot uh, to, to, yeah, to dig out. And I'm sure this sort of computational approach could also be uh, very useful there. Yeah, thanks for the tip. Cool. Uh, any other question? Okay, let's uh, let us stop here. And uh, well, whoever wants to stick around for uh, some follow-up discussions, please do. Thanks again, Siddharth. That was a pleasure. Uh, it's really nice work. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs>